Awesome. So welcome guys. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar with Dr. Christy Lewis and Dr. Rochelle Binberg. Uh, this pod or this webinar is sponsored by Kardish Health Food Center. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction about Kardish and I will then flip it over to Dr. Rochelle and Dr. Christy. So Kardish Health Food Center is Ottawa's leading health food center. Um, we have seven locations across Ottawa and it is our mission to make it easy for you to discover well-being solutions that work for you. Um, we highly recommend you stop by one of our stores. We'd be happy to help you out with anything that Dr. Rochelle and Dr. Christy tell you about today. And we'd just love to see your smiling faces. So without further ado, I will pass it over to our wonderful host to introduce themselves. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, and we're just so grateful to be here. Dr. Rochelle and I, I'm Dr. Christy. And first of all, I do wanna thank Cardish Health Food Centers for uh, sponsoring this event, as well as Rochelle and her team from Third Door Marketing. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes. And so we can really thank them for making this happen today. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be sharing a pretty important message. Uh, Dr. Rochelle and I feel very passionate about the concept of rejecting, letting go, stop dieting, and really getting to that place where you understand yourself and you know what your body needs. So I've been in practice for about 15 years uh, and certainly have evolved as a practitioner to really come to this place where with every single person I work with, I want to truly understand them. And in that understanding, be able to uh, support them with their lifestyle choices to inevitably optimize health. Dr. Rochelle, did you want to share a little bit about you? Sure. Yeah, I joined on with Dr. Christie uh, late last year, which was amazing. I've been in practice for over 10 years now, but I took some time off to help raise my four year old daughter who's now in school more. So um, I, I'm fortunate to be able to work with Dr. Christie and bring on more hours. I also teach at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine on the sports med shift. And in a previous life, I um, was an Olympic rower. I went to three Olympics and I could retire with a medal in 2012. Um, and that's where my interest of naturopathic medicine really came into play uh, and how lifestyle medicine can have such a huge impact on performance. Um, having a positive relationship with food is one of my passions. Uh, I've seen um, people struggle with disordered eating and diet culture um, all, 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 too, all too common now. I, uh, I remember the beginning of my career, I would put everybody on a, an elimination diet, take out gluten, take out dairy. And now I realize how harmful that can be and it can create disordered eating. Of course, um, if somebody has celiac, it's absolutely indicated, but uh, I like a, a balance uh, and that's the way uh, Dr. Christie and I both operate, so. Right. Yes. So, and that is the theme for today. So the flow of today is going to be really about trying to understand kind of your, like the impact, right? So your food choices and really at the end of the day, the being able to know yourself, right? So, so much of the diet culture, and I would even expand to like the wellness or the self-help culture really is about uh, giving you a list of things you can do, right? And there's a sort of promise in that. If we do these things, then we will get desired outcome. But what about your physiology? What about your mindset? What about your situation and what you can access? And so, you know, not only is it not always impactful, it can also be harmful. And so what we want to do today is really show you potentially another way to look at this with ultimately you understanding yourself so that you can walk into that restaurant and know exactly what your body needs in that moment so that you can um, enjoy food without having to feel like you're being restrictive or patterning. And um, we really want to send you home with an action plan as well. So you feel like there's a take home for you. So with that in mind, we're going to start with what drives us. And so why we're starting with this is because, again, so often we wake up on Monday morning and say, that's it, no more sugar. <laughs> and like, that's all well and dandy and a great Monday morning goal, except for we haven't done anything to support our bodies in that. It becomes very much an external message where we're expecting ourselves to do something. So we roll up our sleeves and we will power our way through it. But, you know, come day two, come day three, we're 
really struggling. And it's not that we're having a hard time. It's, it's not that we're giving ourselves a hard time. It's that we're potentially having our hard time because we haven't looked behind the scenes. And so in understanding our body and understanding our mind and understanding our emotions and then looking at our behaviors, then we approach, then we decide, okay, what is the best way for me to eat? And how do I support myself and nourish myself based on that information? So like letting go of willpower and really leaning into empowerment. And we believe, Dr. Rochelle and I truly believe that you know what is best for you. We become facilitators, we become guides, and we become ears to create some objectivity to show you the path. But when you're listening today, there's going to be a ton of information, right? So I really encourage you to, maybe it's one or two gems. You, you get one or two gems and a different way that you haven't thought about yourself or your relationship with food. And really take that and build with that because everyone's going to take something different from this next portion. 45 minutes together. And please, any questions that come up along the way, just include them in the chat box. And at the end, um, Rachel is going to uh, read those out so we can answer your questions. So Dr. Um, Dr. Rochelle, did you want to take it over? Sure. Yeah. So one of my favorite topics is blood sugar and balance. So uh, one thing that, um, that, that is often missed in blood work and conventional blood work is um, uh, your fasting glucose, your blood sugar is measured, but we don't see what the insulin is doing. So I and Dr. Christie like to evaluate what the insulin's doing. Uh, and just to do a, a quick biology lesson, insulin's basically the key that gets the glucose into your cell for energy. What can happen is that your cells become very resistant. They can, uh, a genetic predisposition, lifestyle factors can influence it. And your pancreas has to work extra hard to get that insulin out uh, just to regulate the blood sugar, right? So what can happen also with an increase in insulin is it can um, create uh, fat storage. So um, insulin's not bad, it's needed. It's when it's in excess. So that's one thing we like to look at. Uh, another one is the disrupted liver pathways. So uh, liver, the liver is an amazing organ. It's, it's, it detoxifies so much. I live in an urban center in Toronto. Uh, so you can imagine all the environmental toxins. Luckily I'm in the beach, so I get some fresh air, but it does have an impact. Uh, the liver does have two phases of detoxification. So the first one is basically making uh, the toxins water soluble for elimination. And then phase two adds an amino acid. I won't get into the nitty gritty, but um, then you can eliminate it in your urine or bile or whatever. What can happen is that those pathways can be congested and um, too much of an overburden. And that can lead to a number of um, symptoms, but one of them is weight gain and cravings, but also like headaches and tiredness, sluggishness can all affect the liver. So when I measure the liver, I look at eight points of your liver function. Rather, in conventional medicine, I, I often see just one or two. So uh, I like to do a full analysis of the liver as well. I think that's really important. So understanding what's with the biology in your body and what's going on can actually, um, and, and improving those factors, a lot of it, a lot of the times if caught early, it is reversible, um, that can help as well, so. Yeah, and I think, I think that the, the big message in this, uh, Dr. Rochelle, is really that, I mean, I don't know how many patients you see, but I certainly see patients coming in and really feeling like they're doing something wrong. Like they're just not seeing a shift in their symptom pattern, or they're just in the context of body composition or, or energy or elimination, and they're questioning what they're doing. And this is that diet culture a little bit as well that comes in and says, well, if you just do these things, the reality is, is if your liver is sluggish and your blood sugar is, in, uh, you know, wonky, then until we address those things, you're kind of kind of trying to swim upstream. And that's what we're trying. We're trying to show people a different understanding and, and, and with the body in alignment, then as we're eating the foods and we're choosing foods, it's coming from this aligned place. Mm -hmm. I'm, and, a, I'm a fan of test, don't guess, right? Yeah. So we're just shooting in the dark until you can actually see what's going on. 
So absolutely. And again, as a naturopathic doctors, we look at those numbers just so differently. I mean, you know, you're never going to go into your naturopath or your conventional doctor and say, Oh, my naturopathic doctor thinks that my liver is out of balance. It's, it's really not something we're going to see on, on, fit on uh, labs very often, but you're going to start to see some trends and we want to be able to support that before it does come a problem. Same with the commensal bacteria or the bad bacteria for lack of a better quote here. It's just recognizing that when we are, we are made, we are uh, constructed and made of bacteria. There are so many bacteria in our system and the, the biome and the balance of that can absolutely indicate different aspects of our health, including things like our food cravings, uh, digestion, and even our ability to metabolize. So again, that same analogy, Monday morning, wake up, I'm not gonna have any more sugar, wait a second, if your commensal bacteria is driving your physiology, then these are like little Pac-Man. They're like, feed me, feed me more sugar, more sugar. So maybe your start point Monday morning isn't no sugar. Your start point Monday morning is understanding, okay, do I need to add more fiber? Do I need to drink more water? Do I want to talk to my natural path about potentially reducing this overgrowth so that now as I'm making these choices, they're actually coming from a place of balance within my system. Can't, can't move through this talk today without talking about the stress response. I mean, I think that's really key uh, with everything that's going on in the world. And again, where part of this diet culture comes in, I don't know about many of you, but you know, met, January 1st is often the time when we start to think about what we want to shift in our back, the resolutions, right? The intentions, the resolutions, the diets, the goals, everything. And I don't know about you, but that, you know, went sideways for a lot of people in that, you know, first week, first day, we're finding out, you know, we're back in lockdown, schools are, are closed, snowstorms, freezing cold. So I think it's really important that as we're setting health goals for ourselves, we be very kind to what else is going on in our world right? What can we actually access right now? And if we're feeling really, really stressed, putting ourselves in this pressure cooker of doing better with our food could actually cause more harm to our system. And, and, you know, when we're in a stage of heightened reactivity in our nervous system, we're going to, we're going to uh, secrete cortisol and cortisol is going to cause us to gain fat, especially in that mid range. It's a, it's again, cortisol in moderation, just like the insulin is needed, but when it's circulating in the system all day long, and we're not actually utilizing it, then we're going to be holding on to fat. So here we are trying to do the right thing, but we're actually putting more stress on ourselves, which actually is counterproductive to our end goal. When we have these cortisol imbalances as well, we tend to crave different foods. So for heightened, ironically, we want more sugar. We want more caffeine. If we're exhausted and we can't get out of bed and we're very almost what we call like the adrenal fatigue burnout, we're looking for more salt. So as you're listening through this, you're not going to we're not going to be able to diagnose you 100 people right now in a group setting, but I want you to start to think about, oh, wait a second, maybe that is why I am unable to uh, stop my nighttime eating or I'm unable to, um, you know, get the energy to cook the meal. So be kind to yourself about what else is going on. And the great news is, is that then we can support that to bring balance to that area. What do you, what do you have to share uh, for the thyroid, Dr. Rochelle? Yes. Um, I just want to actually touch on commensal bacteria. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know, Dr. Christie, if you read some of the studies, it, they're done in rat, rats, not humans, but with fecal transplants um, of, of an obese mouse, mouse mm -hmm. and a lean mouse. Mm -hmm. And then they take the, they take the um, fecal transplant of the lean mouse and they're putting it into the obese mouse and the bodies of the mice actually changed. <laughs> So the, the lean, the lean mouse started to put on a, a substantial amount of weight and um, the heavier mouse was losing weight. So and, and this, this research has been repeated multiple times. I think it was first done in 2016 and the last study I saw in it was 220. So it's I know incredible. it's animal studies, but I mean, they're mammals, right? So I just, mm -hmm. the, the commensal bacteria is huge. It's super interesting. That's, All right. that's incredible. Uh, side topic. So um, thyroid. Thyroid is huge on metabolism. Uh, you don't have to have a thyroid diagnosed pathology for it to be sluggish. So uh, I myself have the most common autoimmune disease of the thyroid, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, basically, it means my thyroid was destroyed. I need to take medication. So uh, the body attacked it. 
Uh, it's really, really common. So when I, when I, I'm, you'll see that I'm really big on lab work. So anybody with a family history of any kind of autoimmune diseases and they start to follow the symptoms, I will do a full thyroid panel. And if autoantibodies are really high in the th thyroid, it, it, if you catch it early enough, it's reversible. Once that thyroid is destroyed, it's done. So if I can catch it like 10 years before it's destroyed, I consider that a huge success. So um, to, just to back up a little bit, when your thyroid is hypo, so under-functioning, that means that you're more prone to weight gain, um, more sluggish, foggy brain, dry skin, prone to constipation. And then you can also have the reverse, which is a hyperthyroid. And that's more um, anxiety, sweats, you can get night sweats, uh, hot flashes even, um, more prone to diarrhea, uh, troubles losing weight no matter how much you eat. So it can go both ways, but really having a hard look at the thyroid um, because like I said, tests don't guess, like that could be a big factor too. You could be doing everything you feel that is healthy and right and your thyroid is off. So uh, that's one. Uh, and let's talk about hormone cycles for those that still menstruate or those that do menstruate, uh, you can have different craving fluctuations. So uh, particularly it, the four phases of the menstrual cycle, I, I will spare you the details, but one of the, the, the most impactful is right before your menstrual cycle. So uh, you get a, a lot of women get a substantial serotonin drop and they have more cravings for carbs and, and it, 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 it's normal. It's a part of your cycle. It's what, it's like, if you know it's coming, uh, don't beat yourself up. Up, um, it's okay, but that's that's one of the reasons it's the serotonin drop and recognizing that, and perhaps um, knowing that it's coming. You just want to make sure that you're having lots of vegetables, protein, healthy fats, balance with the blood balance of the blood sugars, going for a walk, um, just incorporating other things to help manage those cravings. And if you have the cravings, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Just you know what I mean? Like you just, it's about adding things in. And if you, if you still want, um, I don't know, the cookies then have the cookies. It's okay. Be kind to yourself. Absolutely. And I think recognizing, especially in the content of hormones is that, you know, we, as women, we cycle and we're not support, we don't have the same metabolism, the same appetite, the same drive all through the month. And so it, when we're looking at, empowering ourselves with the knowledge to be able to make choices that are going to nourish us every day and not be prescriptive and outside of us as a how-to, then we can lean into times where maybe we do feel like we're able to uh, consume maybe a whole food diet with less carbohydrate, refined carbohydrates in the middle of the month, but right before our period, we're not. And that, again, it's like this whole concept of dieties, dieters mentality and checking in at the end of every day. I mean, in a week we have option of, you know, 21 meals potentially and seven to, you know, 14 snacks. So we want to be able to realize that what we're doing in a day or even a week doesn't have a huge influence one way or the other. It really is the yeah. sustainability over time and understanding that that's going to change depending on what's going on in our physiology. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, really the point in all of this is, is, you know, not to bore and overwhelm you, but to empower you, right? It's like, can you lean in and go, wow, like I never realized that part of my weight issues or part of my ability to stick with this or part of my challenges with, you know, food has absolutely not, not a lot to do with my behaviors. And it creates this wonderful new way to think about yourself in relation to this, and you're not doing anything wrong. I think that's the pain point for both Dr. Rochelle and I with the doctor diet culture is it really starts to create that shame cycle, which is, is very, very harmful long-term. And if we can understand and then correct some of these imbalances, that becomes your starting point. Your starting point is not, you know, restricting and counting calories. Your starting point is understanding yourself on a physical level. And by all means, you know, sometimes we need support. I have a naturopathic doctor, you know, and, and a chiropractor, and sometimes we need support to get that objectivity or even the actual diagnostic test that Dr. Rochelle was talking about today. Um, so, you know, get that support to have a better understanding of what your start point might be. Um, the other thing, you know, moving right along into beyond the physical drive is really the mental, the mental part of this. 
So this is huge from my perspective. This is really near and dear to my heart around the mindset stuff, because I think, you know, if we really aren't exploring what's going on in the kind of cognitive um, part of our brains and what, you know, really the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about food, then we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it every time because we just can't, we just so caught up in old societal, deep rooted beliefs, family of origin. You know, if you grew up as, you know, as many people did in homes where diets were the only way and, um, you know, the, the idea of skinnier, better, then it's really hard to untangle ourselves, especially this time of year. So it's not going to shift in, you know, a, a, a five minute slide, but I want you to remember that this is part of the journey. This is really part of the journey. You might've come in today feeling like, okay, I want to know what I should eat for breakfast. But the reality is, is that maybe your start point is a beginning to meditate or become mindful in your body. Maybe it's about seeking some therapy or some support outside because of some of these limiting beliefs that are keeping you away from your ultimate health. So unconscious dieting due to deep rooted patterning, um, this still sneaks up in my day to day, this kind of like counting or restriction or good bad. Um, the idea that food is either good or bad, aka I or our value is I'm being good or I'm being bad. Uh, maybe your last dinner, last dinner thinking, oh, I'm gonna eat all the cookies now because tomorrow I'm gonna start to to eat um better. You know, Dr. Rochelle and I have a whole podcast on why we both keep chips and popcorn in the house just because it's there and we want to be able to be empowered around food. I want to be able to walk into a bakery and decide is my body um, and is my mind and is my heart, uh, can I, you know, in, in desire of a croissant? Yes. Do I want two? Mm, yeah. Do I want three? No. Do I want no to be able to, to, to be able to know yourself well enough. And so being mindful of where it shows up in your day-to-day -day life. Um, falling for sexy, exciting plans, especially right now, right on Instagram <laughs> or any social media, it's really playing to these pain points of not enough everywhere we look, right? It's like, you're not enough and here's your solution. So being able to start from a place of enough and be mindful that this stuff isn't sexy. It's, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's a simple kind of common sense approach that comes from a place of deeper understanding of self. And also to make sure that you're able to trust yourself. You know, that, that you can trust something is new and different and just because it's not restrictive and just because it's not, um, you know, it's not uh, pres prescriptive in how it's doing it doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. Harder and, and more rigid is actually not going to be supportive. And then about yourself, you know, are you, are you feeling worth of the time, the energy? So many people out there right now, really busy with, with other demands outside. Can you prioritize that five minutes to do a meditation or get your water for the day or stop and eat lunch? I can't tell you how many people right now aren't eating lunch because they're so busy at their computers. So really prioritizing some of the basics. You can sign up for a diet. You can count your points and you can, you can measure every piece of food. But if you don't feel you're truly worth Earth, the time and energy, then it's never going to be sustainable. Accepting your starting point, right? You're where you are right now. The idea that we're going to start from this pain point or this place of self-loathing, that's true. If, if you're feeling terrible and, and that, you know, you're, you, you know, you're, you can't accept yourself. It's, that's a really important place to start long before we think about weighing foods and feeling like the stage of life, things change. Maybe you're a new mom, maybe you're uh, just, you know, lost a job or going through divorce. It really is about access. So when Dr. Rochelle and I are creating plans for people, a big, big part of what we're looking at is what can you access? Is it fair to say to yourself when you've got two kids at home working a full-time job that now's the time you're going to start doing green smoothies and making homemade soup every day? Like, is that a fair, is that a fair ask of yourself? And then um, recognizing that, you know, comparison is like, it's really hard. I find this time of year, there's a lot of like fear of like FOMO, like fear of missing out on the program. A lot of people, a lot of community, a lot of friends are like trying something new and sort of going inward and trusting been there, done that hasn't worked, won't work this time. <laughs> If it didn't work, if it hasn't worked, you know, the previous three to five times, it's not going to work this time either. So it's time to look at yourself in a different way. And then, as I said earlier, trusting yourself and trusting the process, like knowing that you're going to be that person that can uh, eat three bites of a cake and say, you know what, I'm done. 
You can keep chips in the house. Um, you know, you can wake up in the morning after, you know, maybe staying up till 12, 12 a.m., eating potato chips, walk, watching Netflix and, you know, drink a, a nice big glass of water and, and get on with your day. Just trust your, yourself in the process. Um, yeah, and, and with that in mind, um, Dr. Shaw, what do you think about the emotional side of things? That's more the thought in the, in the, in the mind. And what about the emotions? Yeah, no, for sure. So um, a, a big part, um, and you, you touched on that, is the, is the stress response, right? So mm -hmm. really understanding in that fight or flight um, experience, like in this day and age, we're not like, we're not meant to have stress all the time. Our physiology is designed to run away from danger, but we constantly have stresses between work, between kids, between family relationships. And, and our, our physiology, we're slow to adapt. We're not adapted for that kind of life. So to have this cortisol constantly, constantly there all the time, um, it, it, it's something that it's, we're not meant to design to do. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you've, you're really stressed out and you eat an entire bag of chips rather than being like self-sabotaging and um, having negative talk towards yourself, just look at it with curiosity. Oh, that's interesting. I must be really stressed right now. I just down that bag of chips. Like what can I do to help manage this? So actually analyze the why. Uh, I know Dr. Christie, you just hired a wonderful psychotherapist. Uh, I know psychotherapists have excellent, excellent tools to manage these barriers in our life that we're having troubles getting through. So uh, that's, that's one thing to understand um, the barriers and how, what are some other uh, adaptive behavior that we can do to manage it. So basically, it comes down to creating a new pattern. So I, I like, maybe you need to go for a walk when you feel like that, maybe you need to meditate, maybe you need to get into yoga. I for one, um, I, I've never been a fan of yoga. <laughs> I don't, but um, I know, I know it resonates with a lot of people. So uh, just finding a new behavior instead of, instead of actually criticizing yourself for that behavior, um, understand the why and, and try to find a way around it, basically. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, really that holistic approach, the idea that the drive behind things, you know, food is so much more than food, right? It's not just about putting it in our system and fuel and moving it's so layered it's so layered in how our body responds to it it's so layered in our thoughts and our beliefs around food and our bodies and then this emotional drive right when we're struggling when we're when we're sad when we're lonely when we're happy and both Dr. Rochelle and I talk a lot about how we truly believe in pleasure, you know, pleasure food. And I will often say sometimes, you know, that make the better than choice. And sometimes the better than choice is pizza on a Friday night with a, with a nice big glass of red wine. It's like recognizing that the good that you're going to get from these foods that just aren't welcome on restrictive diet plans can actually keep us in the game long term and become a whole more of a whole approach. And I'm not going to, I mean, it's not sexy. It's not like that. Okay. Well, I'm going to, do keto and I'm going to lose 10 pounds in a month. And that's what we have to settle into. We have to let go of all of that so that we can really lean into more of a sustainable long-term approach, which is why I wanted to really lean into, we want to, we want to share some behavior. So recognizing this is not now the place where we say, and this is how you do it. <laughs> if you haven't got the message um, or you're still with us, that this is about us believing in you and you fundamentally becoming empowered to know what your body needs. There is the like, okay, but Chrissy, Rochelle, where do we even start with this? And so I do have sort of a sense of how do we line up our physiology so that we can set up ourselves up for success. If we have realized that, you know, the nighttime eating is no longer working for us, well, how do we set up our day so that we're not getting into bowls of ice cream at 10 o'clock at night? Because really what we're eating in a moment is typically reflective of something we did or didn't do earlier in the day. It's very seldom about the more about that moment. So this is uh, about learning to work with your body. And I've, uh, Dr. Rochelle and I've worked with four concepts. It's timing, ratio, then we get into quantity and quality in this order. So if you're brand new and you're like, okay, I just want to make a shift. I don't know where to start. In my opinion, start with the timing. So you start with the timing. You work, I don't care what you eat. I don't care what you eat. I don't care the ratios of what you eat, but you work with the timing and you start to recognize, oh, well, when I have breakfast within an hour of rising, then, um, you know, what happens at lunchtime? And if I have lunchtime, you know, within two to three hours of 
that first breakfast, what happens? So we work with sort of that every three to four hours consumption and a big fan of fasting at night so that our body gets a chance to rest and we can get the good quality sleep that we need. So once we've kind of identified that and said, okay, well, what's the impact of food? And again, as Dr. Rochelle said, with curiosity, what happens when we eat more often through the day? What happens if we don't skip lunch? Are we then able to pull out that yogurt at three o'clock as opposed to maybe that handful of chocolate chips? The reality is, is again, nothing sexy here. We all know that an apple with peanut butter is a better than choice than a handful of chocolate chips. So you guys don't need us to tell you that. It's accessing the apple and peanut butter at 3 p.m. is dependent on, did you have lunch? So if we set ourselves up with timing, and then once we feel like, okay, I'm kind of eating consistently, let me look at my ratios. And again, I haven't talked about the what, none of it. We haven't mentioned kale. We haven't mentioned quinoa yet. Like we haven't mentioned any of that. It's about now working with ratios. Can you have your carbs and protein? So Dr. Rochelle is going to explain what a carbon protein is, but basically, you know, some, some pasta and, you know, some meat sauce, there you go. But the difference is, can we start to do that at a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning carbs and protein, not carbs and protein, not protein and no carbs, right? It's this one-to-one -one ratio. Often fat is a garnish. So what I've seen with the whole ketogenic movement is that fat has become like, you know, you have a salad and oh, well, I'm going to put like nuts and avocado and olive oil and goat cheese and that's not bad, but oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm having, you know, all of this fat, but I'm not having any carbs, right? So it's like, what about just balancing that out and having some, you know, rice or some pasta in with that salad, you know, big, big plate of greens and some protein and then having the fat as the garnish, right? This is literally how I pack my kids lunch. Like this is not... I think my confidence in all of this, our confidence collectively with over 25 years is that it's the alchemist journey that you kind of come back to the, to the basics. So in aligning our bodies and letting go of some of this old thinking, we can see sort of the tree for the forest with all of this, which is very sort of grade tree building our meals in this way. So we work with timing, we work with ratio, and then we can start to kind of fine tune it with other aspects. Did you want to jump in Dr. Rochelle? Yeah, I love this approach, Dr. Christie. It's more about adding things in rather than taking things out and feeling deprived. So when you add these things in magically, uh, most often the cravings for uh, the, the foods that are probably less good for you. I don't like to point good food, bad food, but the cravings actually are less. So uh, I find often when people have cravings in the evening, it's because they didn't eat enough in the daytime and then didn't have enough protein. Those are the most two common reasons I see. So by adding things in, uh, it, it's just that it's a mind flip. Um, I just wanted to touch on the, the keto diet for a second. There is a time and place for it. So somebody that's had a concussion or like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, some a certain autoimmune diseases, but as a general weight management tool, it can do some serious destruction on your microbiome. Those uh, bacteria, they need prebiotics that come from fiber, which often come from carbohydrates. So there has been studies that look at uh, butyrate, which is an off product of uh, healthy bacteria. They've looked at butyrate and uh, with people with long-term keto and it's been extremely low compared to somebody with a varied diet. So uh, when, you, when you mix up your microbiome like that, it can affect your immune system, it can affect your mental health, it can affect so many things. Yes, you can lose weight, but at what expense? So I just want I know it's a very, very popular program and there's a time and place for it, but I just wanted to touch on it. Um, some of the things that, it, it, how it could affect you impact you negatively too. Um, all right, so quality of foods. Uh, so again, we're adding things in, we're not taking things out. Uh, so out of your proteins, uh, this is nothing, nothing new. So good sources would be like chicken, fish, turkey, eggs, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese. And there's obviously wonderful vegetarian and vegan options for those of you that are vegetarian and vegan. So beans, tofu, lentils, uh, all high in protein, even some of the nuts will be high in protein. And they're what wonderful sources out of the carbs. Uh, whole grains like oatmeal and I like the slow cooked oatmeal not the stuff that comes in a powder from a package and you add hot water that doesn't count uh, the whole grain would be encouraged with like some berries and nuts and seeds uh, rice is a carrier for wonderful foods of vegetables and meats 
um, if, if you're not vegetarian or a uh, lentil or, or beans, quinoa is wonderful. Uh, quinoa can cause a little disruption on the gut for some people. So one of the, it's the saponins. So one of the secrets is rinsing it really well if you're one of those people. Uh, and then starchy veggies like corn, sweet potato and squash uh, are excellent. And I like doc what Dr. Christie said, a one-to-one -one ratio between those carbs and those protein hand portions are, are really good. Um, indication of, of, of your body size. So if you do like one palm of protein with one palm of carbs in a meal, plus fill that plate with half veggies and that is a garnish. That, that's a perfect, perfect plate. Uh, out of the fats, nuts, seeds, avocados. I love avocados. Uh, it's hard to get them perfect, isn't it? There's like this window of about maybe 24 hours where you have to eat it and then it's all down south. Uh, okay, and then uh, any diet that tells you you can't have a banana is like, just run. Uh, so fruits, fruits and veggies, whatever you want, just plentiful. Try to make sure your plate is half, half full of them. I encourage. Berries are awesome. They're antioxidants. A little tip, uh, blueberries, you don't need to buy organic. They actually don't have many pesticides. So I don't know, I won't get into the clean uh, 15, the dirty dozen list, but there are some heavily sprayed berries and blueberries. You do not have to buy organic, which is a, a neat little tip for you. Uh, okay, so, and then don't count and weigh any kind of restriction, even somebody with a very, very uh, healthy approach to food. Once you start restricting anybody, nobody's immune. You're gonna, you're gonna want to binge. You're gonna want, you're gonna obsess. You're gonna create disordered eating. Nobody is immune. So um, that's where I really, I really, any kind of count calorie counting and food weighing, it just, it, it's a, it's a recipe for disordered eating. It really is. And the longer you do it, the harder it is to step away from it. And it can happen. I've, I've helped many people step away from that, um, measuring macronutrients and weighing their food uh it just takes time and i think i think what that does is you lose the ability of that intuitive eating you're relying on an app when to eat and i think that can be very dangerous and today's society has made that very easy for us to do because there's some wonderful apps out there that makes it very easy with huge databases of foods already plugged in uh, but you lose the ability to really to really look in and how do you feel? Why are you doing this? Are you really hungry? Are you are you not? So, I think um, I think just getting that ability back. Toddlers are great at this. So having a young kid, it's fresh in my mind. Um, they 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 may not eat for a couple of days and then they just eat everything or they just really listen to their bodies when they want to eat and when they don't. Uh, so I think I think we have through diet culture, we have stepped away from that intuition of listening to our bodies. And it's about getting it back. And it, it does take time. And uh, sometimes you need some outside support to get there. I also actually want to point out uh, diet culture. So I do a lot, a lot of blood work, <laughs> in case you haven't picked up on that. And I see overweight people that are extremely healthy, strong, work out all the time. They're, they're energetic, they're, their mood is on point, like everything about them is healthy, but society would classify them as overweight. And then I will see somebody that's considered very thin and major depression, inflammatory markers through the roof, um, micronutrient deficiencies, not eating very well. Who, like, who's to say who's the healthy person there? In my eyes, I would, I would take the person that's strong and, and no inflammation and energetic, right? So just looking at somebody's body and classifying their health on that, I think is really wrong and we need to step away from that, so. Yeah, yeah, hair in the back of my neck on that one. Like, cause that is, that is a big part of it. And that might be part of this journey, right? It's like, you're listening here today and it might be about acceptance. It might be that acceptance of, wow, I have been taught. I have a belief that if I can lose X amount of weight, that I will be happy, healthy, more lovable, more connected. And it's just not true. And that's that never enough, right? So you lose the 10 pounds, but you're still feeling that sadness, right? Or you're so that's, but deeper, it, it is an acceptance. And sometimes the acceptance, I mean, hey, 
we're all for health. I mean, we're all, we're all, you're getting lots of different information for us. We're all for optimizing and being your best self and evolving to the place where you are feeling so good in mind, body, and spirit. But the reality is, is that part of that is recognizing based on who you or an external expectation of you. And so that's definitely a deeper sort of reflection to maybe take away from today as well. Um, and really putting it all together, you know, recognizing that when we're putting it all together, what really was at the heart and soul of the last 40 minutes that you have so graciously spent with us is really us wanting you to identify or become mindful, what may be out of balance? What's out of balance in your physical body? What have you not looked at yet? Or maybe what has been missed by your conventional doctor that could be influencing not just your weight, not just your relationship with your, with your food choices, but also your overall health. And maybe it's time to do a little bit more exploration in that. Identifying how your beliefs, your emotions may be contributing to those choices, right? How much of that is coming, coming along? How much of an inability to sit with discomfort of anger, fear, frustration is, can you sit with that emotion before grabbing the bag of chips or mindlessly um, you know, eating. And then also, can we make incremental changes over time? Can we work with timing, ratio, quality, and quantity so that we can then start to, again, align our system and we're making choices from what the body truly needs. And this doesn't mean no pizza and no chocolate, right? It means about working with a balanced approach so that we can really have it all. We can choose foods that make us feel good and we can also have pleasure and social experiences that don't leave us feeling um, you know, terrible about our choices. So um, Dr. Rochelle is gonna, gonna lead out here with um, an action plan just to kind of have a sense of something to take home. And then we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm comfortable to spend an extra five minutes or so um, if for questions, but I definitely wanna get through the rest of this in, in a lot of time. So Dr. Rochelle, over to you. Yeah, so just giving you something as a take home, I'm all about habit-based learning. So rather than giving you everything all at once, we're giving you tangible goals. Uh, you may even to go to the next step, it might take you two weeks and that's okay. So uh, in terms of water, water's a funny one. How much do we really need to drink? We're all different body sizes, all different activity levels. One thing, one guideline I like to do is take your weight in pounds, divide by two, and that's how many ounces are a good set point. So say somebody that's, I don't know, 160 pounds, that's 80 ounces, that's over two liters of water. What is it? 64 ounces is two liters. So that's like two and a half liters of water would be a set point. And then if you had activity, movement, sweating, whatever, then you may need to drink more. Uh, another guideline is just to make sure you're urinating every two to three hours. Uh, I know some jobs don't don't really um, jive with that. My teachers are possibly and, and nurse practitioners because you're always on your feet and with with um, the students as a teacher, you can't really leave them. You just you just do the best you can. I, I understand. Uh, so that's one. That's week one. Uh, I've been told that drinking with a straw can increase your water content. So that's a possibility. Herbal teas count. Coffee and alcohol do not. So those are di diuretics. Uh, okay, and then week two, eating at regular time. So 7 a.m., 12, have a snack at three so that you're not having a full seven hours and you're ravenous at seven and can eat everything without even, I know I've been in this position too, where you're so hungry, you just go through all the cupboards, no meal prep, crackers and cheese come out. So just kind of trying to prevent that ravenous uh, free for all, just um, having the regular meals can really, really help with the ratios that we spoke about. Uh, week three, increasing vegetables and fruits uh, to half a plate. Some, I, I find uh, roasted, sauteed, steamed cooked foods in this season, the cold salads may not be as appealing because of course it's so cold outside, but they're, they can also be harder to digest. So uh, I, find, I find I'm a big fan, even spinach, like you can saute four cups of spinach and it reduces next to nothing. So having that with an omelet would be like a perfect thing. Uh, and then week four, choosing whole grain carbs and, um, and uh, protein in a one-to-one -one ratio would be a good goal as well. So uh, this is just a framework. Obviously, you don't have to follow this verbatim. It's just giving you some tools of habit-based learning to incorporate some of these behaviors. Amazing. 
Yeah. So um, I guess, you know, definitely want to spend a couple minutes. Um, Rochelle, do you have a few minutes that you can add I do. on? I booked yeah, it off. So yay. Okay. Awesome. Me too. So maybe we'll, yeah, let's maybe say like five, five minutes for questions. Um, I do just in case anyone needs to jump off the call. I just wanted to make everyone available. Uh, let, let everyone know that the information from today really came from a six week group course that Dr. Rochelle and I do live um, and called Whole, called Whole Food Formula. What we've done is we've actually recorded those into an interactive manual. Uh, so if there was any place where you felt lost or you wanted more information or go to more in depth, it is available on uh, our website, drchristylewis.ca with a 50% uh, discount because of uh, your attendance today. So Cardish, is the code um it's on it's on the slides but it's uh you'd want to use the word cardish in caps and it's 50 percent off if you wanted to explore and get a little bit more information and uh dr rochelle and i are always available for private care and future group sessions if uh, anyone ever wanted to dive deeper and get a little bit more uh more information from us and you can follow us all on instagram we're all on instagram Awesome. Thanks so much, Christy and Rochelle. That was mm -hmm. so useful. And I know there's a bunch of questions in the chat and I know your time is limited. So I'm going to quickly and uh, give you guys some, some questions. Okay. Um, so I, a couple of the questions were um, related to how can you get the tests that you need to know how to manage your health? So for example, um, Somebody wanted to get their cortisol measured. Another person wanted to see how their liver was acting. Another person has their thyroid coming back normal, but they have all these symptoms of hyper or hypothyroidism. So how can we all get the tests that we need to manage our health better? Yeah. So because we're, we have a pub, public health care system, it's very limited in finances. So there's a, basically for a full screen, we're getting the, the, the least, the most minimum you can to get the result. And, and, and we look at things through optimal health. So what's the optimal range, not necessarily what's out of range and what could be point towards disease. We look at what's in the, so low normals and high normals may mean something when we do blood tests we do the full full panel we look at everything like I said eight markers for your your liver we do like four markers for inflammation it's extremely detailed so if any I've, I've discovered so much autoimmune disease unfortunately even cancer that would have gone undiagnosed like you can you can see a lot of preliminary markers and then point towards back to the MD for further whether it's an ultrasound or for a further workup um, lots of micronutrient deficiencies in there so uh, we can sometimes see um, a prelude if, if, if somebody say if their liver if their enzymes are a little bit higher but still within the normal range but high normal maybe that's an indication we need to support the liver a little bit more so uh, Dr. Christie do you have any yeah I mean I think in the in the context of the of like how it really is it's unfortunate we are in it's a little bit of a two-tier kind of approach in that I know when I'm working with patients, I'm gonna listen first to symptoms, right? So I'm gonna listen and assess based on the symptom picture first and ask a lot of questions. That's why that first visit is an hour, hour and 15 minutes, because we're really trying to understand. Then from that, we can really start to deep, deep dive deep as to what like diagnostics would be the most uh, indicated. And this is where we sit, can sometimes use that sort of hybrid model, where if a patient comes in with their own baseline blood work, great, we've got a baseline from the GP that we can start to work with and even encourage people to go back and get what you can from your GP, go in with the symptoms and, you know, get that baseline, but then bring that in to a naturopathic doctor who's going to be able to really look at the numbers and decide what is the next level of testing. So this is that sort of, you can get it all done privately. That's, that's the challenge is it's private, or you can work sort of with a hybrid model where you get as much done with an OHIP, then we can really individualize what additional testing you may need, but it does really inquire, really require visiting a naturopathic doctor to get that level of detail. You can always start with your GP as a baseline. Very interesting. And, and, and like kind of a related note to this, a lot of people struggle with hormonal issues, PCOS, mm -hmm. insulin resistance, um, or, or, you know, that really, really, really bad premenstrual week. Mm -hmm. What can we eat to make that better? 
<laughs> well, I think again, like we talked about earlier, it's it's a, it's sort of about the whole month, right? It's like what have we supported ourselves the whole month? But that week before, in my opinion, it's really staying ahead. So exactly what Dr. Rochelle said is crowding the plate. So the week before, it is going to actually bleed, like because of that serotonin shift, we need more carbs. So as opposed to saying, oh no no, I'm not going to eat pasta this week, or oh I'm trying to avoid sugar, what we want to actually do is consume more carbohydrates, but with the type of quality, like we talked about. So you have a bigger bowl of oatmeal, you have the brown rice, you salt all your food. So you kind of think about staying one step ahead, you consume more do that during that week. So you recognize this week, if it's you're full of cravings, and also your low energy to food prep, maybe you'd make that trip to farm boy, and you make that trip to Cardish, and you grab all the extra fresh fruits, as well as some of the amazing um, whole grains, and you're able to kind of be one step ahead. That's a great suggestion. I, I mean, a lot of us can plan that time of the month and, and prep with that fresh food. Um, yeah. And then I think Dr. Rochelle, you have a bit of an experience with head injuries as well. So one of the questions, and I do actually as well, I have a series of concussions. So one of the questions is what, what can I eat for memory issues, concussions, those, that brain trauma or you know, those diseases that manifest over years, how can I help those? Yeah. things? Yeah. So it depends on the level of the concussion. So, uh, I mean, starting with more of a whole foods diet, I think would be a good start. So like we've been saying all along, lifestyle medicine, crowding out the, the more inflammatory foods, not taking them out, crowding them out. So adding things in. Mm -hmm. So exactly how we've been what we said in this presentation would be a good start. There is uh, some supplements that have been clinically trialed. So I won't go through, like I, we're not allowed to prescribe just as a general, we need to have um, consent to treat, but just throwing it out there to the general population. I know uh, creatine, fish oil, branched chain amino acids, of course, all these things need to be cross-checked with any medications to make sure there's no interactions. But uh, curcumin has been a really good one that can pass the blood brain barrier and help with um, neuroinflammation, which is one of the causes of, um, of, of some of the long term concussion uh, symptoms, I, I have post concussion syndrome myself. So uh, the struggle is real for sure. Yeah, me too. I totally yeah. uh, love all the advice that you're giving right now. It's very <laughs> useful to me. Um, <laughs> another another question. Uh, and I, I won't take up too much more of your time. But what about like, you know, I think you touched on this. Sometimes these eating habits don't work for us. Sometimes we don't, we can't eat big meals every few hours. Is it possible to split that into more meals, snacks, like stuff that works for us on based on our health? Uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, that's the thing, right? I mean, some people get up and they're like, I'm just really not hungry when I wake up in the morning. Like I can't eat within that first hour. So it's like, okay, I am not here. We are not here to set goals we're here to support them right so we're here to support where you're at and part of that is you know challenging some of the physiology well if you're eating uh you know big bowls of ice cream and chips at 11 p.m at night you're probably not going to be that hungry when you wake up in the morning so what happens when we shift that a little bit gently over time um you know so it is trying to understand why a person might have some hiccups in the behaviors, but it's also to really support what is going on for them in their physiology. And the end game here is, is really about knowing self and working with the system, the how you get there, that's, that's the journey. That's, that's, that's the kind of, that's the individual experience for each person. Thank you very much for sharing. I think on that note, we will call an end to this wonderful webinar. Thank you guys so much for your time and advice. It, I can say personally, it was very useful. And uh, I definitely encourage anybody, if you have more questions, uh, please book an appointment with Dr. Christy or Dr. Rochelle. If you have questions about diet, supplements, any kind of food, uh, please visit your local Cardish and there'd be somebody there who'd be more than happy to help you out. Awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone for spending this time with us. Thank you. And thank you, Kardish, for sponsoring. Oh, mm -hmm. Our pleasure. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.